What's up, everybody? It's the Roundtable Sports Podcast. My name is Taylor McLean, and it's been great to have football back in my life, having new football to pour through, and I have been doing so. I'm already 10 games deep into the 16-game schedule, so I've only got a couple more to go, and we're probably going to knock those out today and maybe a little bit tomorrow. Uh, We're going to have them all watched at that point. Been pulling videos off of that, and hopefully you found the podcast from that. Uh, I wanted to go through some of the games that I watched to give my notes on uh, how I felt about the players and and the teams that played. Um, I watched the Washington Commanders beat the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, This was an interesting game to me. Uh, A new quarterback in Carson Wentz and a brand new head coach in Doug Peterson. So I I had a lot of questions about how both these teams were going to look. And I wasn't disappointed by any means. They had a lot of interesting things happen. There's a lot to talk about with both sides. So let's dig into it. I usually like to start with the winning side. So on the winning side, obviously all eyes were on Carson Wentz. How is he going to look? And he didn't disappoint by any means. I think that the Washington fans, at the very least, went into this game with both eyes open because Carson Wentz will dazzle you with his arm strength and with a, with the, his throws sometimes, and then he will also confound you with some of the decisions that he'll make from time to time. He does hold the ball a little bit too much for my taste sometimes, but it's because he's trying to push the ball down the field And he is willing to push the ball down the field at his own detriment and to the team's own detriment sometimes. But it's kind of that gunslinger mentality that you kind of have to live with if that's the bed that you made. The good thing is from a physical standpoint, Carson Wentz looked just fine in this game. The arm is still there. It looked just just as good as it ever looked. And uh, he does get dinged up because he would play recklessly from time to time. So that's a big problem with him as well. But he was hurt to start the season last year and just didn't really look like he had his full abilities last year. So to see him coming out and looking strong, looked like he was running strong as well. He didn't, you know, he took off some, but it looked fine when he was doing it. So it was just a good, uh, it was a good test of how healthy is he and how, did he look and uh, he looked good while he was out there, but he still made some confounding decisions and there was still a good, uh, there was four touchdowns, but there was a big chasm in between those two touchdowns. So while there were moments that wowed me, there were moments that disappointed as well. And that's just going to be the roller coaster ride with Carson Wentz. This is kind of how it is. The good news is, you know, last year he kind of only had, Michael Pittman and it wasn't fully formed Michael Pittman that he was throwing to either. Like I think Michael Pittman probably has taken another step forward. Hopefully we're going to see that um, in the upcoming weeks, but outside of that it really wasn't a lot going on receiver wise. Washington has a good set of receivers. Now I love Terry McLaurin to be clear. So maybe I'm looking at this with Terry colored glasses on, but I love the way that Carson Wentz, was able to lay out that deep ball to Terry McLaurin. Terry has never had a guy that could lay the ball out like that on a deep ball to him. And he's, all you know, I tried to make a video about Terry's deep ball and it's always him having to come back for it to wait on it with Carson. He's going to be able to run under it a lot of the time and teams are going to have to respect that. That's something that you're going to have to respect when it comes to them going over the top. Because uh, Jahan Dotson, I don't think, has the same amount of speed, but he can go up and get it too. He looked like he fit Carson Wentz style. And then that means that the safeties have to kind of play back a bit. That opens up everything underneath. And you've got the ability to take advantage of that with Curtis Samuel, with Logan Thomas, who was back. And maybe Logan didn't look like he was at his peak, but he is coming off an injury. And it was good just to see him out there for them because that just gives them something else underneath that they can use. Getting just not having Cam Sims, not no offense to Cam Sims, but just not having that level of receiver out there at a time. And then having Antonio Gibson, 
who they utilized as a receiver finally out there really helps as well. They were also able to run the ball too. There was t- it wasn't pretty by any means, but there was times they were getting runs from Antonio Gibson. It wasn't all, you know, I mean, they, they only ran for 85 yards on 28 carries. Not great, but that's dragged down by a big loss by Jahan Dotson on a blown up pick. And then, you know, inflated by Carson Wentz rushing six times for 12 yards on escapes and whatnot. You know, he's not super fast, but he's not slow either. He does possess something there. There'll be bigger totals as far as his rushing goes, but I don't want him to put himself in jeopardy too because you need him healthy like he was today if if he's really going to thrive in this system. Thrive eh, may not be the right word, but you get what I'm saying. He's He's got talent there. There is talent there. There's a reason people roll the dice on this guy. You just kind of have to live with the bad decisions too. The picks, you know, not great for sure. But the fact that he has better weapons out there, that kind of allows them to do a lot of other things with the offense that they weren't able to do last year. I mean, like I said, having Terry have the ability to run under a deep throw just makes all the difference in the world for for Terry and for that offense because just like Tyreek backs off uh, safeties in a defense, you have to respect Terry in the same way. Terry has the ball skills. Terry has the speed. So definitely something to look at when you're looking at the the Washington commanders there, you have to respect that deep ball and that's going to open up everything else for their offense. I don't think that the Jacksonville defense became world beaters overnight either. I mean, they played better and having the number one overall pick into your lineup is supposed to make you play better. Right. But it still didn't feel like a world beater defense either. But it does feel like the team has a direction now. So, And it does seem like they have a couple more playmakers than they had before. So to have Carson Wentz play, I mean, as well as he did, there's there's still Carson moments for sure. And a higher-ranked defense is probably going to give them more fits. And and, uh, when Carson is forced to hit it into tight windows and make quick decisions and the like, that's where things can go haywire. And But... This team seems to fit him better, and they don't really have any other choices. They need to lean into him to make things work. They don't have this big time, you know, rushing attack or line. I don't think the line is so markedly improved that they're going to be able to to just lean on the running game. I don't think that is in the cards either. So it's kind of a good fit, honestly. I mean, seems like they deserve each other at this point. On the other side, we had Jacksonville, who played them tight and had some moments in this game, no doubt, that I thought were at the very least interesting. And it made the game entertaining. Like, I didn't feel like Jacksonville was super out of it at any point. And they're coming out of a dearth of talent here where this is just year two of them drafting talent to this team. You kind of kind of have to think of them starting from like a zero point when it comes to this team. So the fact that they looked as good as they did was encouraging for sure. The main thing you want to see from Jacksonville is improvement with Trevor Lawrence and, you know, things kind of have to improve from where it was. It seems like the urban Meyer situation was truly a crazy situation for a rookie quarterback or or any team to have to deal with. So to have your rookie year be tainted with that is not great for your development overall. So you're hoping to see steps from going from a toxic situation to what seems to be a better situation with Doug Peterson. You want to see steps in logic. You want to see him throwing guys more open, just taking steps as a quarterback towards being that franchise guy. And it was a rough day to be sure. And there was some missed throws, no doubt. Like I, I I felt like Trevor was at fault with some of the throws uh, and not the receiver, but the receivers uh, kind of could have done their part too. I felt like they were equally to blame on a lot of it. Christian Kirk, I thought was great. Maybe not as much as he's getting paid great, but he was definitely their best receiver. And he's definitely going to be, Trevor Lawrence's best target. There's no doubt about that. The speed still plays. They're targeting him. They kind of know what's what. Marvin Jones isn't quite the same 
as he was in his Bengals or Lions stints, it doesn't seem. And then Zay Jones is fast, but true like speed guy form, he's not really good at the body control, like point of contact stuff. So he's kind of lacking some of the ball skills, it feels like, uh, for being a number two guy. And then Evan Ingram is big and, you know, he's, he's fine, you know, as a tight end, but he's not top end either necessarily. So I do feel like the weapons could have done more for Trevor ETN dropped a, a for sure touchdown at one point as well. So to keep this all on Trevor that they lost and that, you know, it didn't look super duper sharp is uh, I don't really feel like fair. I felt like Trevor did make some throws. His arm was on display. And he still has the mobility and the ability to get away. He just, you know, it's still year two. And, you know, year one was toxic. And it's going to take him a little time to unbury himself from that and get to that next level where he's on point with all of these throws. And he's not, you know, throwing it just a little bit too far for Zay Jones, which maybe A.J. Brown or one of those number one type receivers catches that ball but Zay just isn't quite one of those guys when it comes to the point of catch, but it is what it is. We can't lament that. We can always say how it looked with those guys and the like, it felt like things were just a little short, a little too long on some. So we got to dial in a little bit. It felt like all the offenses needed to dial in a little bit too. So I'm not going to fault them too terribly much. People don't play in the preseason near as much as they used to. So, and we're talking about a brand new system with Doug Peterson. The good news is the system looked like a system. Like it seemed there was open throws. There was, there was, it seemed like there was actual continuity in what he was doing. And Doug Peterson had a plan. That's a big step up from where it was last year. So to have that happen, that's good for the team. That's good for their long-term prospects. And this is just a situation where they're going to have to draft themselves out of it, spend money smartly, get guys that they uh, that they like in there. As Trevor gets better, it'll be easier and easier to bring in guys that want to play with Trevor. Jacksonville, not exactly a NFL destination. Sorry, Jacksonville, but that you you know what it is you know what dallas is but that's only because of jerry jones we've been trying to get free agents to come to the dallas mavericks for years and they want to go to la or miami or you know that's just how it is new york all those other big cities that's that's we we know what it is although on the football side i don't know about the new york one but anyway i don't want to make this sound all doom and gloom i'm just assessing the personnel the good news is that james robinson was back and he didn't look like exactly peak James Robinson, but he didn't look that different either. He was still running with strength. He still had some burst and some ability to get away. So I like his combination with Travis Etienne for them. I thought Travis looked really explosive and, you know, had he caught that ball, his day would have looked a lot better from a fantasy perspective. Certainly James Robinson eating into the goal line carries isn't good because they were doing the same thing that a lot of teams do. Trevor would get him down there. And then James would come in when they hit the 20 because, you know, Travis needs a rest. It's good for them that they're going to have two guys at this point to mix in, though, because Trevor does need that support. Doug Peterson's offenses need that support. But ETN, I thought he looked really good. I mean, the line, I know he dropped that pass, but the explosiveness is there. And you can see the burst. You can see the the juke. And those are plays he's going to make in later years there. I know it wasn't everything that you want, but he was targeted a bunch. Trevor likes him. I think uh, I think there's going to be bigger days for this offense. Uh, it is a bad matchup with the line because I'm still not super excited about the Jaguars line exactly. Um, at least the tackles played a little bit better. Like that wasn't the problem for them at this point. So that's good. Um, that was kind of the worry spot for them but uh, you need your center and you need your guards to play better too but this is a really bad matchup for centers and guards because washington is, is extremely stout up the middle so you have to be aware a little bit cognizant of that it's kind of like when you play aaron donald your your uh, middle part of your offensive line probably isn't going to have good grades because you're going against some of the best and 
I mean, you know, Washington has spent a ton of resources getting those Alabama guys in there and, uh, you know, being able to cause that havoc. And I'm not looking forward to watching it play the Cowboys, especially if Dak Prescott isn't back by then. So, uh, yeah, interesting game. I, I, I want to see these teams play more. Uh, I mean, we're going to be watching Trevor to see if he takes steps. You know, how does it look? You know, in week six, once everybody's seen this uh, offense for a little while, how is it going to look then? Is he going to be able to make adjustments? That is what uh, truly makes a superstar quarterback is. Yeah, they, you, you know, you've got your fastball, but you've got changeups too. If, if they take this away from you, you can also do all of these other things. So you do, that's why it's so hard as a, as a rookie and then as a younger guy, because you don't always have all of those different parts to your game yet. I also watched the slugfest between the Steelers and the Bengals. On the Steelers side, tough loss to lose Watt for any amount of time. They're trying not to, to go the surgery route with the torn pec, and hopefully you know, he misses less time and can actually come back this season for them because he's one of those guys that is a true game wrecker when he's right in the same way that like miles garrett if miles garrett is on the browns like if he's playing at full strength they are a entirely different defense because he just disrupts so much it's the same way with lt with micah parsons not putting lt and micah parsons on the same level but just it's the same thing where if you're that good and you're causing nick bosa joey bosa when he's right those type of guys, that's that's what people pay for. That's what you want. You want that game wrecker. And JJ and TJ Watt, JJ Watt was for a long time. I, I probably said TJ Watt earlier. I'm going to leave it. Uh, anyway, TJ Watt, to not have him, could color things differently for the Steelers. Steelers, to be clear, have plenty of other talent rushing the passer. But I, I like Highsmith, Cam Hayward. Uh, they have others, but it's a big loss for that and and it gave the Bengals fits in this game for what was supposed to be a improved offensive line that was supposed to be the case was that we were sold a bill of goods that the offensive line is going to be markedly better when they changed out the middle part of the offensive line to be clear that part of the line wasn't exactly the problem they didn't play amazing but they they weren't the the biggest part of the problem there. Now it also felt like everybody got beat at one point or another too, to be clear, but the, the tackles had a tough time and were getting their butts rushed off. One of the high Smith moves I saw was incredible. And then of course you're facing Watt on the other side. Yeah. Things are going to be tough. Cam Hayward is still tough. So, I, okay. There's going to be better days and lesser units that they're going to face, especially if TJ Watt doesn't come back for their next meeting, but still it didn't look markedly upgraded. And I think that people overrate Jonah Williams in their mind, maybe a little bit because he's from Alabama. He has been pretty inconsistent overall. So to see Joe getting his butt rushed off, I could see why things weren't going the Bengals way throughout this game, yet they fought hard yet their defense fought hard and uh, kept them in this game. And really, I think they should have won this game, right? I mean, if their long snapper doesn't go out, they definitely win this game, it feels like. So kudos to the Steelers for getting the win here. And yeah, the defense still looks terrifying. I seems like they've, I feel like they've gotten better on the back end as well. I think if Fitzpatrick was all over the place and just, it just feels like a better situation overall and a better team defense um, from what I saw. But pass rush, getting to the quarterback that fast makes everything feel better. So, okay, let's see it when Watt is not all over them. So there, yeah. On the offensive side of it, I was not impressed with what I saw from Mitchell Trubisky out there. You know, the hope was that they have so many weapons with Claypool, Deontay, Pat Fryermuth, George Pickens, that it would be hard for Mitchell to screw this up. But it does feel like he is still possible of screwing this up on a given day. Granted, doesn't seem like the line is still great. 
He didn't play that bad, though. It just, you know, it's still not a top end line for sure. So the running game wasn't just churning yards. Najee didn't seem like he was at full strength even before the injury. So that's also affecting things. So not to apologize for Mitchell, the Cincinnati does typically have a pretty good defensive game plan too. They, I like that coordinator a lot with what he does. So all of those things work against Mitchell Trubisky, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like his time away from being a starter made him a top end decision maker while he's out there. He has plenty of arm strength and he has the ability to run at a decent clip. It's not even Daniel. It's not Daniel Jones where he has really good speed and then he's not shifty. Um, It's like he has medium speed. So yeah, he's probably going to get caught by some of the faster defensive ends out there. He's not going to be able to outrun everybody. He might outrun some defensive tackles. Okay. He can escape from that. But even then his pocket presence isn't great then either. I don't feel like he has a great feel for when he's supposed to take off. There's this one play that could have really, you know, set the game off where he's rolling left and Fryermuth is just putting his hand up. He's got his hand up. There's nobody within 10 yards of Fryermuth. He's going to be able to catch it right there and do whatever he needs to do with it from there. And Mitchell doesn't even look up. He's too worried about where he's at spatially. He's kind of, it feels like he got injured at some point. Uh, which he did with the Bears, and he's he's worried about the running part of it, which I get it. Taking a big hit from one of these humongous human beings would be scary, but still, it, it was just not what I wanted to see. I wanted to see you know, him making decisions that were not the first read, that you know, I wanted to see progression from him as a quarterback, and he has not made that progression to this point. It doesn't feel like he's ever going to. He's just going to be this guy. Pitch and catch. The guy's wide open. The play goes exactly as expected. Bam, he's got it. Oh, it's very obvious that he needs to do this. He's got that. But if it goes beyond the obvious, that's where he falls apart. And you have to be able to do that as an NFL quarterback. It felt like Kenny Pickett could already do more of that than Mitch ever thought about. And he's a rookie. There's going to be big time mistakes for him, too. And honestly, I don't know what the physical talent level, if you had a like an actual just talent off, like who's got the bigger arm, who's got the who runs the faster 40, who's got the better agility. Mitch probably wins that competition, but he just doesn't have it upstairs. Doesn't feel like anyway. I'm gonna give it more games. And Cincinnati, you know, has a good defense. So okay, but I need to see more, especially for the shares of that offense that I have for the the skill position players, because I really like the skill position players. I like Fryermuth. I like Claypool. Deontay Johnson absolutely has talent. He seemed like he was still a little hurt, which is understandable. He hurt his shoulder, but he was out there. He made a great catch to keep this game going. So I like those weapons out there. And uh, we didn't get to see much George Pickens. That was disappointing. You would have thought he was a ghost out there. He played 45 snaps. So I need to see Mitch spreading that around a little bit better if this if this is going to work so okay not impressed we're gonna we're gonna reserve judgment though we're gonna reserve judgment we're gonna go we're gonna just stop right there and go from there and another another game i watched was the new york giants versus the tennessee titans an interesting game to be sure i know a lot of people probably lost their survivor pool with the titans versus the giants there I know there were probably some people that had the Giants uh, losing for their survivor pool, and uh, now they're out week one. I think there was a lot of that going around, people trying to pick on teams, um, which is the way you're supposed to do survivor. So a lot of people lost a lot of cash on these early games. On the New York Giants side, while I wasn't impressed with Daniel Jones's performance, I think I figured out what the problem is while I was watching. Uh, By the way, he lacks pocket presence in a very complete way. Like he can't feel the guys around him and he doesn't step up in the right ways. A guy as fast as him should be able to get away from people. He's also not shifty or agile really at all. It's really kind of all straight line speed. And then he's just a, he's just not a dynamic decision maker in that aspect or in the passing aspect as well. 
Now, the good news is that maybe that's something he can improve on throughout the year as he gets more comfortable in this system because it is a brand new system and that is tough on quarterbacks for sure. But uh, the, uh, the good news is, uh, outside of that, that Brian Dable definitely brought, brought something to this offense. And I love the way that it was moving in every direction. It had you going this way and then they go that way. They've got motion. They've got shift. Guys are open. Daniel can throw open passes for sure. There's a lot of Mitchell Trubisky, Daniel Jones comparisons there. I think Daniel is a superior decision maker, and Daniel can improvise and can go beyond that Mitchell level we were talking about a moment ago. But it's still it's still just like the second level up, and. He's not not a top end arm. I mean, he's got an okay arm for sure, and there's enough arm there. But you just when you're not processing the people around you, and you, you're not getting cl- super clean pockets all the time, and they're supposed to have a markedly improved line. Thank goodness Andrew Thomas played better than he did last year. That part of it looked good. Evan Neal kind of had a tough day. The rest of their line kind of had a tough day overall when it came to protecting Daniel Jones and and the like. And there were some short runs where Saquon was running into it to be sure, but still you got to play better when it comes to just not turning the ball over with that, not taking those sacks. And then you're a good runner. You should be able to get away from people and get more out of those legs the Titans have been good about rushing the passer and they ha- they do take advantage of some rough situations when it comes to the offensive line, but they, they did have Harold Landry out too. So it's not supposed to be overrun with people. Now, Daniel did make a big throw when it counted, got the big Sterling Shepard touchdown, and then, you know, didn't screw the game up in the end. So there's that, but I need to see more from Daniel Jones. The Giants need to see more from Daniel Jones if they're going to advance from here, but there's more good news as well because Saquon Barkley looked to be back and healthy. I thought he had his explosion back better than he did last year. He was breaking tackles. He was making cuts that that jump cut for the touchdown was beautiful. And those big runs and teams having to worry about the run is going to make all the difference in the world for a guy like Daniel Jones. So you need that in your offense. And with Dayball scheming things, I feel like they're better set than ever to, to do that. And it just raises more questions. It's like, if they got like a domineering running back to go with Josh Allen, would you ever be able to stop the bills? Like if you had healthy Najee on the bills where they can actually block a little bit and you have to worry about stuff versus Mitch, I mean, what would that look like? And we're going to get a taste right now with Saquon as long as he's healthy. Apparently, Matt Breida is the backup. I mean, so I think we're going to see as much Saquon as we can handle. They did a good job of not overworking him necessarily. I mean, he played a lot of snaps, but it still felt like, you know, they didn't go have to go crazy to get where they needed to go either. They're going to, but at the same time, they're going to have to lean on this guy. So looking good in fantasy football, definitely an injury risk just because he had every running back is an injury risk. So if you're trading for him, but the reports about them using Saquon in a big way were absolutely true. And he looks good to boot on that part of it. So good for them. Good for him on the Tennessee side. It was interesting that they had a tough time running the ball as they did. It felt like they were getting better, better bang for their buck passing, which is weird for them, especially when Robert Woods wasn't super involved. And we're talking about Ryan Tannehill. I mean, it's still Ryan Tannehill, so I'm never going to love his pure passing situations where he's required to drop back and throw. But at the same time, he was he was getting things done. It didn't feel in the moment like the Titans were fully there on offense. It just It just felt like they were sleepy a bit. But they got good explosion from their second back, and Dontrell Hilliard definitely write that name down. As far as, you know, having him as your handcuff for Derrick Henry, he looked explosive and looked like he had something. I wouldn't play him over Derrick Henry, to be clear. I still think Derrick Henry is Derrick Henry, even though uh, the video of him getting blown up 
by uh, Tay Crowder is interesting. But to be clear, it's still Derrick Henry. He still looked uh, looked fast. And there's going to be better days for the Titans than this. It's just uh, Leonard Williams is really good. I have a lot of respect for him. And the previous regime might not have done a ton of things great, right? But they were able to bring in talent on the defensive line. And it shows Dexter Lawrence, Leonard Williams up the middle. That's going to be pretty solid overall. And then uh, I like the way that O'Shane played as well. I'm not even going to touch that last name with this dry like that. I couldn't. I didn't remember him off the top, but I'm not even going to attempt that. So they looked better. They just looked more cohesive overall, the Giants did. And then it looked like the Tennessee Titans were just kind of sleepy to me. And uh, I think they'll wake up. I still think their upside is ultimately capped by Tannehill. And I think that's something they know as well. Uh, That's why they drafted Malik Willis. To be clear, I don't think they should bring Malik Willis in at all. He was super raw as a passer. I watched him a bunch in the preseason and uh, going against second and third teams, he still looked super raw as a passer and uh, maybe we'll get a shot at it. You know, Tannehill, you know, has to run a little bit to be effective. So maybe we'll see that at some point, but I don't think it should be something they force on it at all. It would behoove them to have Malik grow more as a passer before he gets out there, I think. So definitely that. The final game that we'll go over today was the Eagles and Lions. I was interested to see how everything looked uh, in this high scoring game. I love high scoring games that are close. That's actually the the games that get the most ratings, the games that people enjoy the most high scoring tight games. This definitely met that criteria. Definitely have some notes from both sides. and, uh, And I always start with the winner. So let's go with that. Jalen Hurts had moments where he looked great today and had moments where he didn't look as good. When he was targeting A.J. Brown, he looked great. And then when he was targeting everybody else, he didn't look as good. That was kind of how it felt in the moment. And that's kind of what the stats kind of show. If uh, Dallas Goddard hadn't had a big play, I mean, we're, we're talking about everybody below 40 yards for the rest of the team. And Dallas got 60 and then A.J. with 155. I think we'll see a little double coverage next week when the Minnesota Vikings come to town. Cause I mean, why not? AJ tore the Detroit lions, a new one. Uh, The the film was just as dominating as the stat line. He's huge and they're getting him the ball in space. And the other team knows that they're going to throw him the ball and there wasn't a ton that they could do about it. So definitely something to, bet on going forward we may have a swing back of the pendulum as he gets double teamed from time to time but still it was uh interesting to see that dynamic out there to be clear on the fantasy front Jalen was running the ball as much as ever and looked as dynamic as ever running the ball he's completely healthy at this point and definitely was able to take advantage of the lion's when they gave him open field. And you love that about his fantasy production. He looks for himself in the red zone a lot because why wouldn't you when you move that way? And the big question will be, are teams able to take away A.J. Brown and able to make him like make his second, third, and fourth read? Is he advanced enough as a passer overall so that when a team is able to take the edges away from him and keep him within the pocket, and make him a pocket passer, is he going to be able to take advantage of that? Or if the situation calls for it, because the game gets reduced down to passing situations when it's tight, like, and you have to throw your team, you know, it's the final drive and you got to throw your team down there. Is he going to be able to take those steps as a quarterback? Cause the rest of it's there and he has gotten better as a quarterback each year. It feels like, it feels like he's been tightening up his game overall, but, To be clear, it's going to have to be more than A.J. Brown for them to get where they want to go. The good news is Cowboys are in shambles right now. And, yeah, I like the way that the rest of the NFC East looked. I guess I didn't realize that I watched all three of the other (laughs) NFC East games. My bad. I didn't mean to make this an NFC East pod, but I sure did by the games I watched first when the coaching film came out. But, uh, oh, well, it is what it is. I guess I was curious what these teams looked like and they you know they they were upsets and i want to know what you know trevor looked like so 
So it just happened that way. Don't don't get on me for it. All right. But anyway, I still have those questions for Jalen. That th- these this this game is as good as it looked at times. Didn't answer all any of those for me. The Lions weren't able to totally put him in those situations. They don't have the type of defense that you meet in the playoffs that has Joey Bosa and Khalil B- Mack on either side, or you know, it's Micah Parsons moving around on you all the time and, and, and kind of disrupting everything. There's, there's different, uh, there's different elements that you're going to meet in this season that are going to be well beyond what the Detroit lions can offer on defense. Cause they're still rebuilding. And while I, I like the changes they made and I, I liked how they looked on hard knocks. Yeah, that looked great, but they still have some growing to do overall on both sides of the ball no doubt but the good news is dan if anybody's going to get them there dan campbell and rodrigo the highest graded player for the detroit defense they're going to get them there but they need a big infusion of talent they've you know they've had the matt patricia era wasn't big on bringing in talent they they seem to have gotten you know things moving in the right direction but just like jacksonville they're going to need to dig themselves out a little bit. This wasn't a, a talent rich team. Exactly. Not to, not to be crude, but it's just, you know, it is what it is. They've been bringing in talent. They Panay Sewell had a lot better game. Deandre Swift. I, I love Deandre Swift. Hawkinson. They have talent there. Jonah Jackson had a better game. Amon Ra St. Brown. They found Amon Ra way down there on the draft. They brought in Jamal Williams, which I thought was smart. They've been making good personnel decisions. It's just a question for them is when do they get a quarterback that's better than Jared Goff? And I don't mean to skip over the Philadelphia Eagles defense. I mean, I'm kind of scared that they have Slay, Gardner Johnson, and James Bradbury, plus they added Hassan Reddick to everything they had going on there. That does scare me a bit. They did lose Barnett to an ACL, so that part's not great, but... Sorry not to not to gloss over them and go directly to Jared Goff here, but I want to give them their due as well, that they're going to have better days than this and that I think Philadelphia is going to win the NFC East now for sure. That that I don't think is in question. The question is ultimately, like for Jalen, like I said, I, I like him a lot. What's his upside? Is, it a, is he going to be Jimmy G where he can get you there, but he can't get you over the top? Like there's a re- there's a reason San Francisco's trying out Trey Lance because they don't think Jimmy G can get him on top. Is Jalen one of those guys, or is he someone that can drive the bus? Is he a bus passenger? Or is he a bus driver? Let's move on to Jared Goff here. I didn't see any sort of progression from what Jared Goff is as a quarterback. To be clear, I don't like the receivers after Amon Ross St. Brown a whole lot either. So, I mean, DJ Chark, eh, okay, I like him. I liked him a lot in an, on in a previous life, but he's not like a, set, a super top end number two. You, you, you think you're better off having him as like your, your speed guy number three. I will, I'll reserve judgment on Chark. He could still have it. So maybe they've – and Hawkinson, DeAndre Swift, they've got some good weapons there, but I don't like the next set of receivers a whole lot. So there's there there is something to having your third and fourth guys being good receivers. So and now with a Dan Campbell team that's probably going to run a lot of heavier sets with the with Hawkinson and with another tight end and stuff. Okay, fine, but still. So I don't think the weapons are perfect, but I do like the offensive line a lot too. So it does seem like a situation that could be a lot better. So it does feel like we should be getting more from Jared Goff, reading the field, making reads beyond where the intended part of the play is, being able to improvise and just putting the ball where it needs to be. A lot of the time there's a bunch of, you know, just misreads and miscalculations. He just doesn't have it. So fingers crossed for Dan Campbell that they don't win too many games and they get a good quarterback here. Because overall, I think the team is moving in the right direction. And despite of the Jared Goff, with them able to block the way they could block at times, that's a recipe for success when you have DeAndre Swift and Jamal Adams running the ball. So 
hopefully Jared Goff doesn't hold them back too much because I want to see Dan Campbell win. I know it hurts him on the inside when they don't, but I kind of don't. I want kind of want to see them get Bryce Young. I don't know that he's going to be the first quarterback off the board necessarily, but I want to see what they can do with a really smart guy. Maybe it's him. Maybe it's Levis. I don't know, but I want to see a different quarterback here because it didn't feel like anything about Jared Goff had, had changed at all. Felt like the same guy to me. And I know that ultimately when it comes down to it, he's not going to be able to get the job done. They don't have a, a Rams when they got to the Super Bowl level of talent on offense. I like the got some of the guys for sure. And it's getting better. You just got to keep drafting your way out of it. Plus, you're about to get Jamison Williams back at some point. And he's going to add a lot to the offense, too. Jared can hit open guys and he can hit the first read and Jamison and Amon Ra, that'll be a good amount of speed. Plus Hawkinson is fast. Well, not super fast, but you know, he moves well for a tight end. So, and then you throw on DeAndre Swift speed on top of that. And you've really got something there. DeAndre had a great game. He just got vultured at the goal line twice and uh, really only got one of the goal line carries. They don't want to beat him up too much. They want to have him, for the full season. So that sucks for his value, but uh, that just kind of is what it is. And uh, we'll have to deal with it and just kind of write that down that it was a hard vulture on the DeAndre part. It kind of took like one of their trickier type runs to get them moving with the run. So kind of write that down for your notebook if you're doing such a thing. Well, anyway, that's what I've got for the game. I know there's a lot of negatives on this one, but uh, I have to be real about these quarterbacks and how I'm feeling about them at the time. I, they all have the talent to be good. Everyone we talked about that today has the talent to be good. It's just they have to win on the mental side. How far can you go on the mental side? How, you know, can you thread those needles with your accuracy? Can you throw guys open? Can you, you know, look guys off? Can you m- improvise a play? Can, can you run out and escape guys? I, it's all of these things I need to see from these quarterbacks to make me feel good about their prospects going forward. We'll see if we see them next time. It's only one game, and a lot of these things are going to change. You know, Sammy Watkins always has a good first game and then, you know, in the last couple of years and then then doesn't have a good rest of the year. So you have to be wary about week one. But I saw what I saw, and I'm sticking with it. Hope you enjoyed the podcast today. Look for more videos. I've been enjoying the videos, making the shorts for everybody. Hopefully you've navigated from there to here. If you haven't done so at this point, download the podcast. That's the easiest way to let me know that you're here and listening, and that's what's going to get me higher up in the algorithm. So do your boy a favor and download the podcast. Don't go back and listen. I mean, maybe, but don't. Don't. I mean, there's no reason to hear this twice. So, But do download it. Delete it after whatever. That'll help me out. And uh, help yourself out by having a great rest of your day.